Prophets have spoken of him from the beginning of time. He is the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. He is our high priest, the Lion of Judah, the child born in a manger, the coming King. He is Emmanuel. Well, good morning, church family, and Merry Christmas to you. Very glad that you are here. Turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. If you do not have a Bible, there is a Bible in the pew rack in front of you, and we would love for you to take that Bible and make it your own as a gift from us to you. Now, you may be saying, Revelation 19, that's a rather odd spot to begin a Christmas Eve service, but this Christmas, we have been walking through the pictures of Jesus in Revelation, because he is high and exalted, and it's so important for us to, yes, contemplate the nearness of God in Bethlehem. And to think of his humility that he came as a helpless babe, born in a manger to a peasant family. But for us also to remember that that baby is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And so we've been walking through the book of Revelation, and there are five magnificent pictures. Now, I've taken them slightly out of order so that this morning we did not have the King of kings coming back uh, with his sword to judge heaven and earth. I figure we'll save that till next week, okay? So if it's okay with you, we'll take those slightly out of order because we will look this morning at how he is the bridegroom who has come for his bride. I want us to begin with a very famous parable by a a Dutch philosopher named Kierkegaard, okay? It's called The King and the Humble Maiden. There once was a king who loved a humble maiden. The king wasn't any king. He was king above kings with power and might to make all others humble before him. Statesmen trembled at his pronouncements, right? None dared breathe a word against his, right? None dared oppose him because his strength could crush them instantly. His wealth was unfathomable. And yet this mighty king, was melted by love for a humble maiden who lived in the poorest village of his vast kingdom. And he longed to go to this maiden and announce his love for her. But here arose the king's dilemma, how to declare his love. Now certainly he could appear before her and represented in his royal robes, all right, surrounded by the royal guard, ready to carry her away in carriage with gold and precious stones. And he could bring her to the palace and put a crown on her head and jewels in the finest silks. And she would surely not resist such a proposal, for no one dared resist the king. But would she love him? She might say to him, that she loved him and she might be awed by all of his royal splendor and and tremble at, at just the thought of what an amazing opportunity. She might tell herself that she would be foolish to reject such a marriage proposal, but would she love him? Or would she just go through all the emotions, or sorry, through all the motions while nursing a, a private grief for the life that she had left behind? Would she love him for himself and not for his title or riches or power? He did not want a subject cringing at his word and unwilling to to do anything, but agree simply because he had said it. Instead, he wanted a queen whose love knew no restrictions or limitations. He wanted her voice to speak to him without hesitation. 
neither barriers nor walls. That the love that they would share would cross the chasm, right, that had separated and kept them apart. Bringing the king and the peasant together and making them the unequal equal. In short, he wanted the maiden to love him for himself and not for any other reason. He had to find a way to win the maiden's love without overwhelming her or destroying her will to choose him. So the king realized that in order to win the maiden's love, he had only one choice. He had to become like her. Without power or riches, without the title of king, only then would she be able to see him simply as he is and not for the position that he held. He had to become her equal. And to do this, he must leave all that he had. And so one night, after all within the castle had gone to sleep, he laid aside his golden crown, removed his rings of state, took off his royal robes of silk and linen and redressed himself in common clothes of the poorest of the kingdom. Leaving by way of the servant's entrance, the king left his crown, his castle, and the glory of his kingdom behind. The next day, as the sun arose in the east, the maiden emerged from her humble cottage to find herself face to face with a stranger, a common man whose kindly eyes requested an opportunity to speak with her, and if time, he might win her heart and her hand in marriage. Beloved, as we contemplate Christmas, as we contemplate Jesus this Christmas, As we've combed through the book of Revelation, we've seen that he is the high priest who is none other than God himself, that he was the lamb slain for our sins, that he was the child born to us that caught up to heaven, changed everything in the heavenlies. And this morning we will see that the babe in a manger is the king who has come, the groom to win the heart of the bride. Revelation chapter 19, as I begin in verse six, listen to this. Then I heard something like the voice of a great multitude, like the sound of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder saying, hallelujah, for the Lord our God almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him, for the marriage of the lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, write, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Then he said to me, these words are true words of God. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, as we contemplate the magnificence of your word this morning, may you teach us, may you give us the ability to focus so that we might comprehend your heart that we might actually be overwhelmed by seeing your heart on display, your love for your people, your bride. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now the scene that we have just read is like watching the final scene of a movie or reading the last chapter of a book. Now, some of you are weirdos like that, and you pick up a book, and you turn to the final chapter, and you read that last chapter, okay? Because you, you want to know that everything is going to be fine in the end. Now, I would tell you that that's a terrible way to read a book, but it is excellent theology, okay? It's, magn- it's great theology. All right, so 
in order for us this morning to appreciate more fully this magnificent picture that we see at the end, you need to understand that this is a long storyline woven through the entire Bible. That God is the valiant, selfless, noble groom who has come to win his people, his bride. Now, before I go any further, I just need to address an elephant in the room, all right? That is the fact that this analogy tends to cause uh, especially men to get quite uncomfortable, all right? A little squeamish because we don't like uh, taking the woman's role in the analogy, all right? Additionally, within marriage, there is a physical intimacy that's tied to it, all right? So instead of you having these awkward feelings the entirety of the service, we're just going to deal with it up front, okay? This is an analogy, okay? It's an analogy. Just like the scripture uh, uses the language that you are an adopted son or daughter of God, Now, with that language, you immediately know that the love that a father and mother have for their children, God has for us. The permanency of being a child, being in the family, even when you make mistakes, that permanency is ours in Christ. So the two most intimate Meaningful relationships that we have in all of life are with our children and our spouse. So it is no surprise that Jesus and the scripture use both of these relationships to point to him. Okay? So, get all the weirdness out. Let's pick up our storyline in Genesis chapter 15. When God is making a covenant with Abraham, we're told in Genesis 15, 12, that God causes Abraham to fall into a deep sleep. You remember this? It's, it's a bit of a weird kind of section uh, of scripture because there's an ancient practice that's taking place here. Abraham falls asleep in a smoking pot and a torch passed between animals that have been cut in half. Now, here's the point, though. You are supposed to remember as a good reader that just a few chapters before that, God caused Adam to fall into a deep sleep in order to create Eve. You see, God's covenant with Abraham is like a marriage covenant. In fact, if you think about the fall for a moment in marriage terms, God is the picturesque husband. And Adam and Eve have every one of their needs met. And then some, abundance and intimacy with God. But then Satan comes along and tempts them to question God's goodness. Is God holding out on you, withholding the very best? So that when Adam and Eve fall, it is the ultimate act of unfaithfulness towards God. God's covenant with Adam, with marriage imagery, is designed to stir your emotions. God is yet again taking a people unto himself as a bride, even after man has been unfaithful. God has pursued God has made magnificent promises of provision and care. And in return, all he expects is a faithful wife who finds her delight in him. You see, where Kierkegaard's illustration breaks down is, you see, we like to imagine the humble maiden, which, by the way, is us, is lovely and secretly worthy of the king's affection. But the Bible actually tells a completely different story, one of unfaithfulness 
the inability to keep our affection towards him. The people of Abraham's promise becomes Israel. Now, remember with me the first of the Ten Commandments. Do you guys remember? What's the first? Now, you shall have no other gods before me. Well, in Exodus 34, and Exodus 34 is the rewrite of the Ten Commandments because the first time Moses got the Ten Commandments, he came down the mountain, and they had already uh, created another god, and Moses threw them down and broke them. So in the rewrite of chapter 34, I want to show you this language, right? You shall have no other gods before me, okay? For you shall not worship any other god for the Lord. This time, God inserts additional language. For the Lord, whose name is jealous, is a jealous God. Otherwise, you, make it, you might make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and, and they would play the harlot with their gods, and sacrifice to their gods. And someone might invite you to eat of his sacrifices. And you might take some of his daughters for your sons. And his daughters might play the harlot with their gods and cause your sons also to play the harlot with their gods. I I put this there because I want you to see the language. I don't want to belabor the point. So let me tell you that over 200 times does the Bible use the phrase, play the harlot, describing God's people going after other gods, other pleasures, finding their supreme delight in in things besides him. Now, the level of emotion and vulnerability is staggering here. God's jealousy is not the jealousy of a stalker who has no right or claim. It is the jealousy of a rightful husband who desires the affection of his wife. He wants her to trust him, to find her provision in him. Find him all satisfying, that in his presence is fullness of joy. Now forget not that I am talking about the sovereign king of the universe. But this is his storyline to you. But no matter what the divine husband attempts, his people, his wife, they are unfaithful. Now, there are a few passages that I could turn to, but today I have chosen Ezekiel chapter 16. Now, I will not read it. I will uh, summarize, and and partly because the language there uh, is so rough that many of you would question if I'm still reading the Bible, all right? That's a little tease. You go read it on your own, you adults. It's PG-13 plus. Ezekiel 16 is an extended metaphor where God says, Israel, I found you as a discarded baby squirming in your blood, but I had compassion on you, and I cleaned you, and I nourished you, and I raised you, and I made you attractive, and then I married you. And as your husband, I adorned you with beauty, with precious stones. I put a crown upon your head and jewelry of gold and silver. I did everything to make you exceedingly beautiful. But you trusted in your beauty as if it wasn't a gift from me. And you played the harlot You were yet again unfaithful to me, an unfaithful wife. You took my gold and my silver, and you gave it to your lovers, my bread and my oil, everything that I had given to you. Now, when you read this, dear Christian, you are not to be sitting on your high horse looking down at Israel's unfaithfulness as if it were not your own. Yes, see the shame, but know that Israel's unfaithfulness represents us all. 
Romans 3.11, there is none who seeks for God. No, not one. So God sits as a cuckold husband. Now you should strike me dead for even suggesting such an image of God. As a pastor, I have counseled, sat across from husbands who are in the situation where they are cuckold. The helpless state of disarray. Longing for her affection. But another man has it. What more could I have done? Why am I not enough for her? Pastor, how dare you suggest such imagery of God? Friend, this is God's imagery for himself. Read the book of Hosea. It will make you blush with embarrassment. Now consider for a moment how any husband... And specifically, a perfectly righteous husband that God is. Now, now consider for a moment how he might respond to this situation. Adam and Eve were unfaithful. And now after all that he has done for Israel repeatedly, over and over and over again, they are unfaithful. First of all, what is just? What is a just response? Well, to send her away, to divorce her, to give her to whatever consequences she deserves. But now put some real emotion behind it because he could rise up in pride and anger and wrath. He shouldn't be defending his honor. Why is he seen as the pathetic, jealous one? All that he has lavished upon her is his goodness. And her incessant response has been to be unfaithful. No more. That is it. Now comes my unfiltered wrath. But neither is how God responds. He does not give us justice. He does not give us wrath. Instead, do you know what he does? He sends his son. He says, I will buy her again to myself. He says, I will lay down my life to purchase my wife a new heart. I will rip out her heart of stone and I will gift her a heart that beats for me. My spirit will indwell them. That's what I will do for my beloved. That's the celebration of Christmas. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That the king chose to condescend even further for the unfaithful maiden. Weary one, does your heart still ask if he truly loves you? Behold the cost that he was willing to endure to obtain your love. Because he rendered the heavens and was born a helpless babe. Further still, he endured every trial and temptation on your behalf. Further still, love sweat drops of blood over the cup of your sin. Further still, love cried from the cross, it is finished. 
all to make you his very own, his bride, his beloved. Is this not enough for you? Do you not yet see how wicked the heart is that still says, nah, I'm, I'm going to find my satisfaction elsewhere. But every good thing is a gift from him. Delight in the giver, not the gift. Nah, I don't want to give thanks. I just want to do whatever I want to do. See, on the other hand, a Christian's heart explodes with gratitude for his mercy, right? Thank you, Jesus, for the depths that you did plunge so that I might behold you. Oh, love that will not let me go. I rest my weary soul in thee. I give thee back the life I owe, that in thy ocean's depths its flow may richer, fuller be. It is Jesus' final night, the night of his betrayal and arrest. Now he knows that his disciples... Uh, Sorry, he knows that this is his final night, but his disciples do not. And so when Jesus tells them, they are confused and frightened. So in John 14, Jesus comforts his disciples with betrothal language. So in Jewish customs, uh, a betrothal was, it's like our engagement, but it's much more binding. It actually required a certificate of divorce to break the betrothal, okay? And you got to understand that the culture and customs, right? Uh, There was not new land. uh, So you had communal living. So when you proposed, you would say to your bride, I'm going to go to my father's house, carve up a piece of his land that will become our land, and I will build on to the father's house a place for us, okay? That's the picture. And then I will come back and get you. Now that I've described that, listen to John 14, verses 2 and 3. When Jesus says to his disciples, in my father's house are many dwelling places, If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. Now, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. On the evening of the wedding, the groom and his friends, the the groomsmen, they would come in a procession to the bride's house with music and dancing and instruments and possibly a shofar that would blow, that would declare, like, everyone get ready, here comes the procession while the bride's party awaits. The groom shows up and then escorts the bride back to his father's house for the marriage feast. And the, and the groom and bride, they would, they would be on animals in front with the whole party now following behind in procession with lamps and singing and instruments and dancing, all of this going on. And once back at the groom's father's house, In royal weddings, they would check invitations to get inside. You couldn't get in without an invitation. And everyone wanted to go to these, but you had to have an invitation. And then once you are inside, this is an abundant feast with the best 
wine, and as much food as the family could possibly afford. Now, some of you guys have done big weddings, but you need to think in a culture, right? Like my big fat Greek wedding, where they just go over the top with what they do. Because these these feasts, right? You would invite as many of your friends and family as could possibly come. To refuse an invitation was the highest insult. And these wedding festivities would continue for a week, sometimes two weeks, think about that, with music and dancing and laughter. It was the pinnacle of joy and jubilation. Revelation 19, verse 7, let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him for the marriage of the lamb has come. And his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And he said to me, write, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. So now the final scene is ready to unfold. Because the groom, at last, has his bride. And his unfailing love is on full display. It is the greatest love story ever told. Such humiliation, such mercy for his Beloved. And at last, the bride will behold him and no other. The older I get, the more my memory fades and things fall out when I sleep. But there is one thing that will never fade. That is the moment I beheld Lane as she was coming down the aisle to me. I can see it right now, the look on her face. Beloved, the climax of the entire scripture is Revelation 22, verse 4, that says, and you will see him face to face. You will behold him and no one else. This entire sermon has been stirring your heart for that very moment. Now, one quick point of application. Because every bride anticipates, prepares, imagines details upon details about the great marriage feast and what she is going to wear. And verse 8 tells us that you and I will be clothed in the righteous deeds of the saints. And our righteous deeds. Now, Ephesians 5 tells us that Christ is in the process of cleansing us and helping us to accomplish those righteous deeds. But make no mistake about it, you will be clothed in your righteous deeds. That is the times that you have walked in faithfulness and allowed God to work through you. Your generosity, your obedience, your willingness to pursue forgiveness, the time that you invested in people, loved and prayed for them, the times that you gave them the gospel will show up as jewels, as magnificent adornment at the feast. You don't just show up on that day and go, hey, what are we doing here? No, 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 Jesus warns repeatedly about those who have not prepared for the wedding feast. The Gospel of Luke concludes his birth narrative by presenting to us that there are two individuals advanced in years who have been long waiting for the promised one. 
Both are waiting in Jerusalem and will see Jesus at the temple when he is presented at eight days old. Scripture tells us Simeon is full of the Holy Spirit. And when he sees Jesus, that he's been longing for this, and he declares, I can now die in peace. Anna is from the dispersed tribe of Asher, long lost tribe of Asher. And she represents an even greater longing. Because you see, they're asking the question, would, would God's people be forsaken had they out his love? But at long last, the groom's arrival had answered all doubts. He had come to die for his bride. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, as we have uncovered your magnificent word this morning, your picture of your longing for us and for our affection and the length of your long suffering and patience, your, the cost of what you have been willing to endure so that you might have our affection. Who are we that, that we are worthy of such attention, such pursuit? And yet this is what you have declared. This is what Christmas declares. And so we pause right now to say thank you. To say that you are more than worthy of our affection. To say forgive us for our unfaithfulness and our wandering heart. Would you bind it to yourself? Would you bind us to you? Because we long to walk faithfully. Father, if there's anyone here this morning that does not know you, I pray that right now they would cry out in faith, having seen your magnificent pursuit of them, that they might have faith and that they might believe, that they might surrender to you, repent from their sins, that you would forgive them and that they would be called now your beloved. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.